Hi everybody, I'm Jackie Lewis and this is Love Period, a podcast about how we're going to love ourselves, love our posse, and love the world fiercely on the way to making our lives and the world better. Today my conversation is with Mark Charles. I know him as an activist, an educator, and trainer. He is Navajo and Dutch clergy and philosopher who opens my mind always to think about the founding of our nation and what we need to do to make it better. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Mark Charles, it's so good to talk to you today. How are you? Thank you, Jackie. It's great to be with you again. I'm always pleased to have a chance to have a conversation with you. I just want to, before I begin, acknowledge I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C., where I live with my family, and these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. And I want to thank the Piscataway for their stewardship of these lands and just say how humble I am to be living on their lands today. So, But thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you, Mark. And when you say that, I want to acknowledge that the Collegiate Church, all of the Collegiate Churches are on Lenape land, and I want to acknowledge the past keepers of the land and the present Lenape who live in and around New York and New Jersey still, and also the ways that our Dutch Reformed Church was not very kind in the transaction with those folks. So we owe a a debt that I don't think we'll ever be able to repay, but I'm really delighted to be able to talk with you. Mark, you are Dutch and Indigenous. Do you think of yourself as a multiracial person or multi-ethnic person? Yes, I do. And, and I, if people have heard me speak before, I usually give my traditional greeting where I say, Yate, Mark Charles, Yenishya, Tsin Bake Dine Nishle, Doto Higlini Bashes Chin, Tsin Bake Dine Dasha Che, Doto Chini Dasha Nala. So in the Navajo culture, we introduce ourselves through our four clans two on my mother's side, two on my father's side. So my mother's mother is my identity. And oh. so my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage. And so normally for a white American, we would say Bilagana, which just means a white American, essentially. Mm-hmm. But because I wanted to be more authentic, I wanted to find a way to uh, express my mother's people. And now during World War II, the Navajo Code Talkers actually gave names to most of the other nations, hmm. um, both on the Axis and the Allied side of the war. But the Dutch weren't a big enough role in the war, so they didn't get a name. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and so when I, I, I actually sat down with some of my relatives, and I said, uh-huh. I want to find a way, because Navajo is a descriptive language. And so I wanted to find a way to uh, describe my mother's people. Mm. And we decided on Tsin Bake Dine'a. Tsin is wood or sticks. Okay. Bake is shoes and Dine'a is people. So it's the wooden shoe people I love for the clomping. That. I love yeah. that. Wooden shoe people. Oh, my goodness. My mother's mother is Tsin Bake Dine'a. And then my father's mother is Toa Higlini, which is the waters that flow together. My mother's father is also Tsin Bake Dine'a. And then my father's father is Toluchitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. So because I'm Navajo, where whenever we're in public, especially on our own reservation or among our own people, and I do this whenever I speak publicly, I always introduce my four clans. And because if I'm going to identify as Navajo, I have to acknowledge and honor my mother's mother. So I cannot say I'm Navajo without describing my mother's mother who is Dutch. That is wonderful. (laughs) And so that's forced me to acknowledge, and and not that I wasn't doing that before, but even more so as as I've gotten more of a public persona, it's made me in every situation where I introduce myself to say, uh, my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's who I am. And so I very much describe myself as the son of my mother and my father. The son of your mother and your father. And so the the way that, you know, as I've been talking, especially about race over the past two decades publicly. Right, yeah. I've actually done a lot of reflecting on the role of people who are biracial, like myself. And one of the things that I've, whether whether it's living here in Washington, D.C. now, or living in California where I went to school, or living on the reservation, Had I just chosen to identify with one or the other of my parents, if I was on the reservation and only said I was Navajo, it would make life so much easier. 
if I was here in D.C. and I could just say I'm only the son of my mother <laughs> right. and not my father, it would make life so much easier. Of course, the color of my skin doesn't allow me to say that. But because I'm both, you know, when we work at these issues of racial conciliation, of addressing white supremacy and systemic racism, the journey always gets hard. And there's always the temptation to drop out of it. There's always the temptation to say, I'm just going to stay with my people and be in this safer space. But because I need to acknowledge both my mother and my father, I can't do that. I have to, even when there seems to be no other path forward, I have to continue working for this racial conciliation because I need to, if I'm going to be Navajo, I need to acknowledge my mother's people and my father's people and find some way to, to bring beauty, harmony, conciliation into those relationships. Mark, I think that's beautiful and, and hard and beautiful, right? All of those things. You know, there's a way in which, I hope this resonates for you. I've been recently in a conversation about the multi-everything ethnicities at Middle Church, right? I mean, I'm African-American. We have indigenous family. Uh, my mom and dad are both from Mississippi, and we've got indigenous relatives I'm always loath to say which tribe, which nation, because I think it's gotten blurred over time. Like my, my aunt will say, I think it's Blackfoot, but it could be Cherokee. I'm like, okay, that's not exactly the same. So I'm trying to do some, some work around that. But, but we claim that. We see that. We see it in ourselves. We see it in our relatives. And then, of course, I don't know where I'm from, Mark, really. But anytime I'm in D.C., which I love to come to your town, I get in a cab and I have Ethiopian or Eritrean cab drivers call me sister. Yeah. So they don't think I look West African. They think I look like them, which I'm happy to claim. My grandfather, my mother's father, looks exactly like all of those Ethiopian cab drivers, which you and I know was is odd because the slave trade wasn't really about Ethiopia. But right there, my uncles look exactly, some of them look like you, my friend. So it's interesting. Yet... Let's just go, I'm African-American, I'm black, in a simple way. Simple as in you say, I can make that choice, right? I can say I'm African-American and that's it, as opposed to claiming two different kinds of uh, streams of, of um, ethnicity. But when I get to church, Mark, and I'm the black pastor in the multi-ethnic church, that is its own kind of border crossing, right? That is its yeah. own in America, in these United States. That's its own kind of complex identity, is to be black in a multi-ethnic context. How black are you in a multi-ethnic context? What do the people in the multi-ethnic context think of your blackness? Is what I'm saying resonating with you? Yes, it absolutely does. And it's because <laughs> I think race is, whether you like it or not, is defined or centered by whiteness. And Willie Jennings talks about there's a proximity to whiteness. And so because of this understanding, there's a proximity to whiteness and the, how what your proximity is depends how much you get to partake of, I don't want to call them benefits, but of the fruits of whiteness, you know, and so the color of your skin obviously is a massive barrier to that, but financial standing, gender, all these other things, sexual orientation and identity, all these things. So if it's, it's technically the white landowning Christian male that's at the center. That's the white standard. That's right. That's right. And then every other group is kind of defined in these circles beyond that. Right. That's right. And, and so, yeah, this is the challenge with dealing with race because race is somewhat of a moving target. That's bull bullseye. That's right. It is, isn't it? And, you know, even the way race was constructed. So as an African-American, the black race was constructed through the one drop rule. Right. If you have a single drop of African blood, you're black. You're black. Blacks were the enslaved. Having that population grow and expand was beneficial to whiteness because that was the labor pool. The American Indian race was constructed through the one or through the blood quantum rule. You're full, you're half, you're a quarter, you're an eighth, then you're bred out of existence. This is because, well, the myth is 
America was discovered, there were no people here. There's treaty obligations to Native people, so they want as few of us as possible. So they construct the black race to multiply, and they construct yes. the American Indian race to eventually be bred out of existence. Of existence, right. Do you see the quote? I can't even say it now. Which one of these electeds said something about coming here and there not being that much culture anyway, and then going, well, well, the indigenous, but... That was Rick that? Santorum. Rick Santorum. Who was speaking at a conservative conference, a Christian conference, I believe, um, and he said that America is unique. I don't have the exact quote in front of me. He said America was unique because it allowed European Judeo-Christian people to come here and start a nation from a blank slate. Yes. And he said, yes, there were some natives here, but they have very little impact on Western culture. And so that doesn't really matter. And immediately that was decried by Indian country. Yes. As a racist comment because it completely... A, a, it was false. Again, my book, on selling Truths, begins with the statement, you cannot discover lands already inhabited. So, <laughs> you, you have to acknowledge there were people here. So, there was no blank slate. Exactly, exactly. These lands were ethnically cleansed. And then it completely diminished or dismissed the contributions of Native peoples right. to American society and even to American culture. That's true. And I saw it, you know, I'm in a blur right now. Mark, in so many ways, right? The fire that keeps burning, you know, the fire that burned the church down keeps burning in the way it preoccupies my mind. So you, you and I were together at the Revolutionary Love Conference. And I feel like since then, I've been a, in a blur. But I saw that come by, I think, through Cheryl and Eiffel, who also decried it. But this idea of the erasure of a people, Mark, is a kind of a heartbreaking, a heartbreaking truth around our nation. I write in my book, Fierce love. I'm writing, what happens to the children of the people who were disappeared? So what happens to the children who watched the flaying of black flesh and their children and their children's children? Uh, the bloody fingers picking cotton and their children and their children's children. Mark, what happens to the children of the indigenous who watched their families you know, burned, pillaged, raped, who were snatched, kidnapped out of their homes, who were trying to have the indigenousness, the Indianness of them kind of cultured out. I'm, I'm thinking about that in terms of love. And I'm thinking, how do we, how do we love ourselves? How do we love ourselves, stay in love with ourselves, remain in love with ourselves when those are the stories in our psyches? What do you think? Well, see, uh, it's interesting this week because it was not long ago that Joe Biden, the Biden administration, acknowledged that what happened in Armenia was genocide, which was very challenging for our Turkish allies because they committed this genocide. And he acknowledged it. And several times a week I, I do, it's not even a podcast, I just go online and I live stream, I called my second cup of coffee, where I talk about issues coming up as I drink my second cup of coffee. And I talked about why President Biden was able to acknowledge the Armenian genocide, but will not acknowledge the native genocide enacted by his own country. And to have that conversation, I actually looked up the UN definition of genocide. So one of the reasons the Armenian genocide wasn't immediately defin defined as genocide is that took place in 1905, I think, or 1915. And the term genocide wasn't actually defined and popularized until 1943. And so it's kind of retrofitting this idea into what happened historically. But one of the components of genocide is to remove the children from the group and place them in another group. Now, you can do that physically, like the boarding schools where you take them from the group. You can do it by murdering and killing their parents and their families and their community. But you can also do it emotionally and psychologically, right? So even if you, if you, if you take Native youth from their their homes, their communities, and you educate them in a Western worldview and give them a whole new language, even if you send them back to their community, they are no longer very able to be cohesive within that group because of language barriers, because of culture, but all these other things that got inserted into them. And so, you know, this is the challenge when we look at, and this is, I think, one of the things we're facing today, especially in the millennial and the Gen Z um, populations, where these young people especially Gen Z, right? They are one of the most, not only diverse, but they're one of the most pluralistic 
groups of people. Yes. Where they are open to gender identity, they are open to racial identity, they're interracial marrying and cross cultural, you know, all these things. They're very open to those things because the world they grew up in, they live in, is very diverse. Their parents, right? It was a generation ago where it was illegal to have a cross racial marriage. Yes. 1960s. It was illegal. Yes. And so their parents. Loving versus Virginia. And so this is where now I think the Gen Z, especially, as they see what's happening, where among their peers, they don't feel those racial and gender identity silos near as much as their parents and grandparents felt them. But the world is being run by their parents and grandparents, who still very much have those silos established. And so they're kind of, as they're growing up in this diverse, pluralistic, very inclusive world, as young children, as they get older, they're being forced to step into these silos that are very much established for how the world runs. And that's very discombobulating and even confusing for them. Love Period will continue in a moment. I feel like when I see you in the world, being yourself in the world, you're a very confident person. How did you learn to love yourself in this nation? And does it ever waver, you know? How did you learn to love yourself in this nation? Probably one of the most beneficial things I did to understand even my own racial identity was moving with my family I was pastoring a church in Denver, Colorado. This is early 2000s. And we moved back to the Navajo Nation. We didn't go as missionaries. We didn't go even with a role. I wasn't going to pastor a church or work a government job. We moved there and we lived in a remote part of our reservation in a Hogan. I did some consulting work online, but we were there. We occasionally helped herd sheep. We were like, we we lived (laughs) in that community for three years. And we lived on the reservation for 11 years. We had no running water, no electricity. And this was while I'm, I'm observing politics. I'm observing the world. I'm observing things like, uh, whether it's the tsunami that happened in, in Indonesia and India or the, uh, election of President Obama, you know, and I'm watching all these things. I'm actually learning about the doctrine of discovery and I'm watching how politicians campaign nationally. And yet I'm sitting in what I would describe as one of the most powerless places in the United States of America, which is Mm -hmm. Indian reservations, where it's one thing to be marginalized. I live in Trinidad today in Washington, D.C., and we are marginalized. Our community, which is largely African-American, has been marginalized, but we're still seen, right? We're, we're We're still seen because we're in the middle of everything. When you're on a reservation, you're almost invisible. Out of like sight. People, I... That first three years there, living on the, in the Hogan, I could literally count in the first year and a half of living there on a single hand the number of non-native friends who came to visit us on the reservation. On a, I, like, nobody came. I literally, I described it, it felt like dropping off the face of the earth. And so while living there, I was really pressed to think through about what does it mean to have a voice in this? especially as I'm learning about the doctrine of discovery, as I'm learning about the systemic nature of this white supremacy and this racist world that I'm living in and I'm a part of, I'm, I'm, my, my children, right? It was, it was my grandparents and my parents' generation that were put into boarding schools. My children are going to Navajo immersion schools and are learning the language and the culture in the schools. And, you know, it's, it's just, this is just a generation and a half separation between them. And yet it's night and day difference of what they're learning culturally. And I'm sitting there and I'm observing all this. I'm experiencing this. I'm seeing my kids grow up with a even a, a greater understanding of the language and of the culture than I had as a young man. And even as I have as an adult, my, my son to this day speaks better Navajo than I do because he spent six years in a Navajo immersion school. And so observing all that there and then being kind of faced with the challenge of how do you begin to address these systemic problems? And one of the key teachings that 
creator God gave me came from the example we see of Jesus in the Gospels about, I call it the biblical dynamics of power and authority. So, power is the ability to act, and authority is the right of jurisdiction. For power to be effective, you have to demonstrate it. Authority is inherent. You have it or you don't. I don't have to prove it to you. Our nation, and I would argue Western Christianity, is obsessed with power, and we demonstrate it all the time. Yep, no argument for me on that. But when you actually look at it, we have, as a nation and as a church, almost zero authority. We lose our nuclear arsenal. We go bankrupt. There's hardly a country in the world that cares anything than what we say. Because we have no authority. We have no integrity. We have a ton of power, which is why people listen to us. But we don't have any authority or integrity to, for them to care what we say if we don't have that power. And then I looked at Jesus and most of us think Jesus was a powerful guy, right? He raised people from the dead. He walked on water. But when you look at the descriptions in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Mark, almost everything Jesus did wasn't through his power. It was through his authority. And when he gave his disciples authority in Mark 6, and he sent them out to preach the word, to heal the sick, and to cast out demons, his first command to them was to lay down their power. Take nothing with you. And that, I actually have that teaching online several places. It's called the Biblical Dynamics of Power and Authority. I've taught on it several places around the country. There's some great videos of it online. I can share some of those with you if you would like. But understanding the difference between power and authority, and I would actually frame what God, one of the things God was doing in me in the 11 years I was on the reservation was instead of gaining power, title, prestige, resources, diplomas, blah, blah, blah. God was instead teaching me how to speak with authority. Can you just connect the dots there to loving yourself? Is that a frame you would use? Yeah, because what it did, well, so several things. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into this. (laughs) For me, helping me to understand myself, right? One of the biggest challenges we face as a country is this lack of identity, where we came from. We have hundreds of millions of white people who think their existence in the world for their people started when they got off the boat. We have millions of African-American people who were kidnapped, stolen from their own lands, had their histories erased by and large, and brought here and enslaved. This is one of the reasons I think the whole issue with having your DNA tested and, you know, who who, were, is because there's this people like I want to know who I am. Yeah, there's a big thirst for that right now, right? Oh, who absolutely. Yeah. And as a Navajo man, I didn't have to get a DNA test. I know my clans. I know my relatives. I know my family. And I was actually able to go back to the reservation and live in a very traditional way and able to not only gain that experience for myself, but give that experience to my children. And this is, this is a gift that you can't buy you can't steal, you can't commandeer. This is a gift that needs to be given to you. And so, having the opportunity to understand fully who I am, not only on my father's side, but even on my mother's side, I actually was able to go to to the Netherlands during this period. And I spent time in the parts of the Netherlands where my mother's family was from and got to see and connect with some of that part of my my identity as well. And so, these are the things where I think it's really helped me to, under- yes, as I said earlier, being biracial, it's easier just to stay in one place or the other, and, and you know, that, that can at least lead to less conflict and less less trouble. But by understanding more fully who I am, it allows me to much more, to better engage in the work and the conversation and the dialogue, we need to find a way to move it forward. That's so right. That's so rich. And and you had the blessing, Mark. First of all, you have the blessing of knowing that there is a not a simplistic ethnicity, right? There's not a simplistic story for you. Dutch and indigenous, Navajo and Dutch. That's not a simplistic story. But you also have the chance to get with your people, with your posse, right? So I'm really I'm really connecting the dots in my own work about how much love of posse and love of self, like love of our own people and love of self, that being surrounded by 
but being surrounded by a village, if you will, being surrounded by an Ubuntu village. You know, I am because you are. That how children and, and as adults, all of our life cycle, how important it is for us to be in the place where we can go, yeah, yeah, these are my people, right? And our people might be different than we are, but this idea of a kind of a, my people, my posse, loves me, holds me accountable. I love them, they hold me accountable. And that grows my, that grows my self-love. Do you find that to be true? I love what you're saying there. Let me actually add a little bit of my own journey into that. Sure. I won't go into depth on this. I could, I could preach a whole sermon on what I'm going to say, hopefully <laughs> in the next two or three minutes. But okay. one of the passages God opened up to me, starting when I was in Denver pastoring the Christian Indian Center, a native church, and including my time on the reservation, where I began looking at the, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, if you look closely and through a cultural lens at that parable, the son doesn't just leave his family and go off and sow his, his oats in another land. He is a Jewish man who leaves the land, he leaves the law, and he leaves the people. Mm-hmm. That's right. He leaves who he is, and he goes off to a foreign land. Again, these are people who have promised land, right? These are people who love to be on their promised land. He leaves the land. He leaves the law. He leaves everything. He goes to a foreign place, feeds pigs, does this wild right. living, and then he comes right. home. And one of the things I did is I preached this sermon, this parable, by retelling it as, as how I thought Jesus would tell it if he was on the reservation. So, I Ooh. translated it all into Navajo context. Okay. And when I looked at the gifts the Father gave... And I translated those into what they would be equated to in the Navajo culture. What I realized is the father wasn't just giving gifts, even financial gifts to his child. He was restoring his cultural and ethnic identity that he left when he took off in the first place. Oh, interesting. And that parable, right? The parable, we call it the prodigal son. It's not the prodigal son, it's the prodigal father. The parable is about the character of the father. It's not what the son did when he came back. It's what the father gave to the son when he returned. And so, one of the things that got so deeply thrust into my heart is when I come to God, he sows in me, he revitalizes in me, he restores in me the cultural, ethnic, and understanding of who he made me to be. And what's so amazing about that, especially in this world where we're getting our genetic tests and people don't know where they're from, right? Well, the beauty of this is this is about creator. You're from creator. Creator knows who you are, Jackie. Yes. He knows Amen. where you're from. You better preach that. He knows your entire lineage. And I have seen this so overwhelmingly abundantly in my own life that with absolute confidence, I can say to people, when you return to God, when you are with God, when you walk with Creator, one of the things Creator does is restore in you the identity He gave you when you were put on this earth. He knows perfectly. It's not about you go on a journey to understand it. The journey is the one that Creator takes you on, and He does this as a part of bringing you back in wholeness. That is so beautifully said. It rings my heart around Psalm 139, which is my favorite Psalm in the whole book. But that you know me completely. You know me. You know my lying down and my rising up, right? Is there anywhere I can go? Before words on your lips, he knows it fully. Can I go anywhere where you don't see me? (laughs) Yeah, I love that. Oh, that's so beautiful. And that is actually, I think, right, the source of you know, the source of our self-love, the source of our ability to love each other, honestly, is creator love, right? The, the love that flows over. Even for the people who don't, you and I might talk about God, we might talk about Jesus. I think everyone, for everyone, that love that is the source, the love that is the creative source, you know what I mean? The, the, the love that called us out, that said, you know, that spoke us into existence or loved us into existence. That is a source of the self-love. That is the source of the posse love. And I think, Mark, also it is what gives us that co-creator kind of love. Like, I also am a steward, right, of the earth. What do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, this yeah. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. You know, one of the things I, I'm doing right now is three or four mornings a week, 
And in the start of my book, I talk about one of the best disciplines I've ever had spiritually is watching the sunrise. And living in the concrete jungle of D.C. for six years now, I had lost that practice because it's hard to see the sunrise here. And after the election, I was so in need of reconnecting with creation and just the physical world around me that I, I found a place that's 20, mile, 20 minutes from my house. I have to drive there. But I can sit right next to the Potomac River, and I can watch the sunrise come up over the water. And I've been doing that three or four mornings a week. Almost every morning that it's clear, I've been doing that for the past probably two or three months. And I, I sit there, and I actually have been live streaming them. I, I live stream them on my Facebook page, and I put it on my Instagram channel. And what it does is it reminds me, right, one of the, one of the lies we're told in society, in Western culture, is that we can control things. And so much of our stress comes from our, our attempts to control everything around us. Yes. What indigenous culture knows so fully well is there are things we can't control. And watching the sunrise, not once every two months when we go to an early flight, watching it day after day, week after week, month after month, and eventually year after year, what that communicates to our hearts is there are things that take, take place, like the sunrise that we have no control over. We can't make it happen quicker. We can't make it happen later. We, it, it happens. If we're there, we can appreciate it and be grateful for it and even participate in this beautiful picture creators making. Pity. Yeah, yeah. But we can't control it. And learning how to live in a world without being afraid of being out of control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thing. Is incredibly freeing. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's really true. And then our job to steward and to be a part of that world in a way to maintain it and to, and to help it continue to flourish is so important. And it seems to me, Mark, that the folks who are interpreting scripture early, so not you, not me, but this idea of, you know, subdue the earth or control the earth or, you know, manage the earth that comes from the way, I mean, if, the, if love is this concentric circle, self, neighbor, posse world, and you've been taught love is about power over, or love is about subdue, love is about control, your cosmology and your love, your love stuff is all messed up. <laughs> you said to live freely, and I'm, I'm the one to, to love freely, is to open our hands and recognize what doesn't belong to us and what we can't manage, but to kind of have an unconditional regard uh, Jim Loader said, I think, non-possessive delight, he said. But to have unconditional non-possessive delight in each other, in the world, in the neighborhood, you know, in the creation, that's liberation. Like, read it like a book. You know, watch it like a movie. Here it is. Here it is before me. How do I enter in with my arms open, right? So we've talked a little bit about loving yourself. I love that the journey home got you there and loving your people. If I ask you, what do you know for sure about love? What do you say? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the scripture, love is patient, love is kind, is not self-seeking. I think for me, when I, when I think about love, if we're truly going to love one another, the first step we need to take in that journey is we need to be able to acknowledge everybody's humanity. So much of the havoc we wreak upon people is because we don't acknowledge their humanity. And I know it sounds very basic. It sounds like this is just, but I literally think that is the first step. You know, whether it's the church acknowledging the humanity of everybody and not discerning who we're going to bake a cake for and who we're not, right, based on our theological ideals. One of the things I loved, and this was, this was a few years ago in politics, right, when, when Dick Cheney was vice president, he was one of the most hawkish conservative vice presidents we've ever seen in our country. And he was the pit bull for, for George Bush. And he did his bit, you know, he was, he was fierce and he stood by Bush on every single issue except one that I can think right. of. Right. Yeah. Gay marriage. Why? Cause his daughter. Cause his daughter. Yeah. Is gay. And so he could not advocate for the dehumanizing, demeaning policies that the Bush administration was trying to, and he broke from him and said, no, I am going to acknowledge the humanity. Mm -hmm. The particular humanity. Yeah. 
And so I'm so convinced this is one of the biggest struggles that we face in the United States of America is we cannot even agree that all of us are human. The church can't agree on that. The nation can't agree on that. that fun, the foundations don't state that. And if we can just get to that point of saying, we're going to acknowledge the humanity of everybody. You know, I've taken over the past several months, not only of saying black lives matter, native lives matter, but I also say frequently, white people are not superior. Right, because these are the lies we're told. Not only are we told black lives don't matter by what happens to them in our policing system, and our criminal justice system, not only are we told that native lives don't matter because of land titles and everything else, but we are constantly told, both implicitly and explicitly, that white people are superior. That's why we call it white privilege. And so I found it's just as necessary to state. Now, some people have accused me, said you're being racist. It's not racism to say you're not superior. <laughs> the fact that someone thinks it is, is a problem. Yeah, it's kind of truth, yeah. And so I've actually, you might want to say this is setting the bar kind of low, but the step I am working hardest on right now in the church as well as in our country, I can't legislate love. I can't force people to love one another, but I can absolutely assure you we will never love one another if we are not able to recognize each other's humanity. And so that's where I'm starting. That's so good. That's so both elemental, and essential, simple and profound. Yeah. Love starts by recognizing the humanity of the other human being. Yeah. Mark Charles, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Tell us where we can find your best stuff. What's your website? You can find me on my, online. My website is markcharleswirelesshogan.com, W-I-R-E-L-E-S-S-H-O-G-A-N. And that's my username on most social media. That's my Twitter. That's my Instagram. That's my YouTube. I have a, a verified account on Facebook. You can find me there easily just searching Mark Charles. So, yeah, I'm very active. I'm even on TikTok. <laughs> so you can find me online. I engage a lot daily i'm online live streams and and posting and stuff like that and uh yeah i would love it if people would connect with me there they can order a copy of my book on selling truth we're actually selling signed copies of that on my website at wirelesshogan.com but yeah i, I would love for people to reach out and and follow me on social media because i'm doing everything i can to push this conversation forward let's keep talking mark thank you so much appreciate you thank you Love Period is Corey Big, Paul Swanson, Izzy Spitz, Sarah Janzak, Jenna Kuiper, Sarah Palmer, Nicholas Kramer, and I'm Calissa Brewster. This podcast is produced by the Center for Action and Contemplation, which is located in the heart of New Mexico, thanks to the generosity of our supporters. We also have other podcasts you might like. You can find those wherever you like to listen by searching for Center for Action and Contemplation or visit us at cac.org to find out more about our other programs. From the high desert of New Mexico, we wish you peace and every good.